Figures are astonishing, but to see the pictures and video coming from the region can be even more heart-wrenching. Joining me now is Jeffrey Stern, a freelance journalist who recently returned from West Africa, where he chronicled the outbreak for the magazine Vanity Fair. Jeffrey, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you, Mike. Let, let's start with those numbers, because numbers can be deceptive. That's one of the things that comes through in your article. At one point during this outbreak, uh, the medical field kind of thought they had this thing licked, and they didn't. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what happened really was that there were a lot of cases that were hiding. There were people that had become um, either unaware of what they were really dealing with, or in some cases actually actively resistant to the uh, to the medical community that had kind of descended on uh, Guinea at that point. It was really just Guinea for a couple of months, um, and so people began hiding and 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 pushing back against the medical community that had descended upon the region. We're at this stage now, and we don't know where we are really in the epidemic, how much longer it goes on, but you went back and traced it from the very beginning. So you went to the small village. Tell us what you found and, and tell us how you went back and did kind of the investigative work that you did on this. Yeah, so we started, I started in uh, Conakry, the capital of Guinea, and worked my way down into the forest region. It's this very treacherous two-day drive through the forest um, down to what is in some ways a very remote area. It's very difficult to get to. The roads are terrible, of course, but it's also very close to three borders. Um, and the virus, of course, doesn't respect the borders. Um, and it became very easy for the people who, who had the virus to move into different countries. The response, of course, was a little bit more difficult. It's difficult to coordinate across multiple countries. Um, but what, was, what I found in the village where it started, a, a really small village called Million Du, just a few hundred people, um, the people there were, were confused, really, is the best way to describe it. The elders there said that they'd lost about 40 people. Um, this was just three or four months into the outbreak. Um, they were solicitous of help, unlike a lot of the villages there that were a little bit resistant and mistrusting. Um, and what's happened now is there's been kind of a secondary scourge because now they're very stigmatized, just like some of the families that have Ebola patients are sometimes scorned, cast out of their society, cast out of communities. In this case, you know, they have the unique distinction of being the village where it began. And that's made it really tough for them to do business with other villages. The taxis don't go there anymore. Um, they're not hunting bats. Bats are one of their primary sources of food and trade, and have been they've been outlawed by the government hunting bats. It's a it's a law that no one really respects, but this village says that they do. Um, so now they're hungry. Now, frankly, that's the second scourge they're dealing with. Mm. You use the word confused, and I think that's an important word that that also deals with the medical community because one of the things you talk about in your article is cholera. And that there are a lot of the same sort of symptoms, and you also talk about this Hollywood vision that blood squirting from the eyes, which right. is not always the case, and that really kind of uh, was kind of a hang-up for a long time, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. In fact, there was an effort to change the way we talked about the virus from uh, Ebola hemorrhagic fever to Ebola virus disease because it became difficult to to convince people to not just look for you know really prodigious bleeding but to look for some of the other symptoms and not to immediately assume um, that if someone had had was losing fluid was vomiting and diarrhea that it was cholera because they've dealt with that unfortunately in this region it's endemic there malaria too there's a lot more kind of common illnesses that look a lot like Ebola for a lot of the virus's course, and it's part of the reason it took a long time for anyone to identify Ebola. It was three and a half months into the outbreak before we knew what was going on. Hiccups. Talk to us about hiccups, because most people don't know this part of the story. Yeah, and I didn't know this either until I talked to one of the epidemiologists. Uh, he's based in Brussels. He came as soon as, um, as soon as Ebola was suspected, he came to West Africa and began working on it. But the reason he uh, initially suspected Ebola was because he looked at a medical history of nine or ten patients that had died of this mysterious illness and he saw hiccups, which is associated with hemorrhagic fever and especially Ebola for reasons we're still not entirely sure, um, something to do probably with distress in the diaphragm, but it, it, was, it was kind of a hint to him and he immediately uh, alerted his superiors at uh, Medicine Sans Frontieres, Doctors Without Borders, and they immediately put a plan in action and began intervening right away before even blood samples were taken to labs. And talk to us about funerals, how in many respects that, that has helped to fuel this. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting because typically Ebola outbreaks tend to be very small and very quick because the virus, once symptoms show, kills so quickly that it never has a chance to spread it. It burns itself out, so to speak. 
It's different here for a number of different reasons, but one of them is because uh, funerals are traditionally, there's laying on of the hands, there's very close contact between you know, the mourners and the, and the corpse. Um, and towards the end of the, of the virus, it, the virus particles bubble up through the sebaceous glands and it can live in sweat and other fluids. The bodies remain hot, as we say, for uh, up, to, up to a few days. So funerals actually became a really effective means of transmission. Talk to me about the response. Uh, president, uh, the U.S. president uh, making a very forceful uh, speech today, also talking about how the, the rest of the world has to come to the aid of the people in West Africa. What is your sense on what's needed having been there in the region? I think that more than anything, it's resources. It's, um, and in a way, there's a hopeful subtext here. The, the narrative, the dominant narrative for a while was this recalcitrant villages that I mentioned earlier, the, the resistance to the medical community. And now we're hearing about people lined up outside of, out of, outside of treatment centers, unable to get help, which is tragic. Uh, but in some ways, it shows that there's something of a sea change, that there's at least an acceptance that this is a medical problem, not some spiritual curse, and that it's possible for us to deal with it. The fact that now we're beginning to see, besides just a handful of organizations, we're beginning to see the international community coming together and throwing resources at it, I think is a really hopeful thing. All right, Jeffrey Stern, we're going to leave it there. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks, Certainly Mike. appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Up ahead, a detailed report about the fate of Scotland as it heads for the crucial referendum and how Kiev reached out to the rebels in eastern Ukraine. My childhood in the U.S. was pretty rough.